All right. Well, once again, I want to welcome you all here this morning. Thank you for being here. I know there's probably uh, better things that you know you could be doing on a Saturday morning than listening to me. And I also want to welcome the Dallas Fort Worth Options Trading Group. Thanks for being here today. I do appreciate it. Today I want to talk a little bit about credit spreads and I want to be, um, it, it, this is going to be a little bit different. We'll, we'll go ahead and we will define the rules that I use for trading credit spreads once again and kind of revisit that. But what I really want to do is focus in on the setups. You know, one of the things when I got into options, you know, I kind of got sold into this idea that credit spreads boy this is the place to be this was the this was the jewel you were going to be able to just kill it with credit spreads because they're just easy how many have ever had that had that experience where you just went through that class and thought oh my gosh credit spreads is a place to be but they never really talk about the importance of the setup. They talk about how great credit spreads are. They talk about how great they're the easiest thing to do. They they talk about the fact that selling, selling premium, boy, that's where you want to be when it comes to trading. But they never really get to what it means to set up a good credit spread and what they're really talking about. So we're going to spend some time more on the ideas around setting up a good credit spread and what it means to look at those charts in a new way um, to do a good job. So really quickly, let's review. I'm just going to um, review this really quickly on the rules that I use. Now, just because I use these rules certainly does not mean that you need to use these rules, but this is what I do for my credit spreads. The majority of the time, I'm going to be looking for um, credit spreads, and I start looking for them usually around 45 days to expiration. Okay, about 45 days to expiration. And I want to try and have them all put on. I want all of my credit spreads on in about 30 days to expiration. So I'm really taking advantage of that front month and I'm taking advantage of that very fast decay rate that occurs in that last month of options where I really get an opportunity to, to, to ramp up that theta, okay? <clears throat> has, has, anyone, has anyone traded a lot of credit spreads? Never? Traded a lot of credit spreads, okay. <clears throat> when you trade credit spreads, what's one of the uh, one of the most important things to to think about when it comes to credit spreads? Everyone wants to trade credit spreads, and they think they're the greatest thing in the world. But what is one key factor to trading a credit spread? One of the biggest key factors in trading a credit spread: patience. Patience is one of the key factors. That's right, Kim. They are a time trade. Okay? Theta refers to time. And if you don't um, have the patience to wait for your profit to come into these trades, credit spreads are not your place. They require a significant amount of time to become profitable. Okay, and so we have to have a good mindset when we come to credit spread trading and remember that time is the key element here in making these trades profitable. That theta decay is very, very important. So the rules that I use for choosing the options, first, I'm gonna be in that front month, right? 45 days, 
somewhere I start looking there, about 30 days to expiration. That's where I want to get all of my credit spread trades on. And this is because I get the best bang for my premium. I don't want to, I don't want to put on credit spreads, um, you know, 20 days to expiration. I normally can't fit my rules on those really short term credit spreads. So here's the rule. Anytime I put on a credit spread, I look for one third, approximately one third of the spread. Okay. And credit. Man, I can't write with this thing. One third of the spread as a credit. Okay. You want to get that number that makes it worthwhile. And let me give you the reason for that, that one third credit. If you, um, if you put on a credit spread, and, and this comes from experience, guys, the experience of um, the biggest loss I ever took in my entire life was credit spread, tra credit spread trading. And I'm talking a big loss, five digit loss. Because I was trading with a bad set of rules and a bad um, impression of the trading, okay? Because I, I got sold into the idea that credit spreads were almost a no-lose situation, okay? So I was trading credit spreads where I could get, I was getting very little credit. I had very high probability trades until that one month when everything just goes against you. Okay, so if I do a dollar wide spread in a trade, I want to try to get somewhere around 30 to 33 cents and up in credit. Because if I do a dollar wide spread and have 30 to 33 cents in credit, that means my risk is going to be around that 70 cents area, right? It's going to be about 70 cents of risk in that trade. If I have a trade gap against me, and we know that happens, right? We get into a trade and then something occurs and the stock gaps against you. And you take the full loss in the trade. Well, with a credit spread, if you have, if you, if you really mind this rule, about 30% or uh, one third of the credit, you can recover a full loss in about two, two and a half trades. Okay, if you take credit spreads that have much, much less than a third, and a lot of people do this, they take these credit spreads with much, much less than a 30% 30, 30 credit or a one third um, credit in the trade, what they end up doing is they'll have a series of wins because the probabilities will be really high on the trade. But then they get that one loser and it wipes out six, seven, eight profits on trades. There's just one wipes out a great big bunch of winners. And that's why I have this one third rule on that spread. So to set up the trade, what I'm always, this is the rule of setting up the trade. If I'm looking at a call credit spread, okay, I'm gonna be looking at that 45 to 30 days to expiration. I'm gonna be looking for about one third credit in the trade. I'm going to be selling an out of the money option that has somewhere around 30 deltas. Okay, that out of the money option, somewhere around 30 deltas, as close as I can get or even a little bit less is okay if the volatility of the option is pretty high. Okay, so I take advantage of probabilities. If I have an option that has a 30 delta, it tells me that this option has a 70% chance, not a guarantee, but a 70% chance based on the mathematics of still being in the or out of the money at expiration. That's what the math tells us. 
And then of course, I'm going to be buying, this is the one I sell, it's gonna be the closest to the money, and the one I buy is also out of the money. And you know, and that's gonna be probably, um, you know, various stock to stock and um, series to series, but uh, probably going to be, you know, in the 20s in, in Delta position. High probability it will be out of the money to set up my credit spreads. Now, if I'm doing this with a put, Okay, on the put side, all the only thing that changes here is this is going to be negative deltas. So I'm gonna be out of the money to set up these trades. Everyone kind of understand those rules? Did that, does that kind of make sense to you? All right, now one of the things that gets talked about a lot in credit spread trading, and you've probably heard this a hundred times over, is, <clears throat> well, that's true, that's true, John. You actually, it's a delta positive position for the trader itself, but in your, in your trading platform, it's gonna show as a negative delta, okay? The one you sell is always the closest to the money. And we're gonna talk about the setup here for a second, okay? Uh, well, that's what we're gonna spend most of our time on today is an actual setup, how to, how to put these together, okay? Now, one of the things you always hear about credit spreads, and you'll hear this all the time, is the time you wanna start doing credit spreads is when volatility is really high. when volatility is really high. If you do a put spread, it's called a bullish put spread. So no, a put spread would be a bullish trade. A call spread is considered a bearish trade. A call credit spread is a bearish trade. Okay, so it's, it's kind of backwards of what a lot of people think. <clears throat> okay. So we get this we get this impression from folks that tell us that the time to trade credit spreads is when the implied volatility is really high. That's when and the reason they tell us that is because that's when the premium, right? The premium is high. We get more dollars for trading high implied volatility credit spreads. We make more money trading high volatility credit spreads. But what they don't go ahead and tell you is what does, what does a high volatility tell you about the stock? The high volatility is already telling you that there's more risk in the trade. That's why the volatility is high. The volatility is high because there's bigger expected moves. So never trade a credit spread just because the volatility is high. High volatility means that you are taking more risk. The prices of the options are higher for a reason because there's more risk. Okay, so don't just use high volatility alone as your reason for putting on credit spread trades. Okay, now I believe to be a good credit spread trader, it requires the ability to, or, or it requires a really good study of price support and resistance. If you don't take the time to study price support and resistance in a chart, your credit spread trading will always suffer, in my opinion. Okay, because if we see a stock that just takes off and starts moving up, 
and it moves up excessively and reaches a known resistance level in the chart. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, now first off, I can't get long this trade. At this point, this to me would be a parabolic move or an extreme move to the upside. It's an emotional move. I can't take that upside trade. It's too far up. There's too much risk in that position. We know that after we move up sharply, the high probability there's going to be a pullback, some kind of reaction, a profit taking move where that stock pulls back. So as a stock approaches a known or a strong resistance area, that's where I want to be thinking about placing my credit spreads. Okay, and I'm going to go up here and I'm going to buy an out of or sell, I should say, sell an out of the money call. Okay, this is an out of money call and it's going to be somewhere around 30 deltas out of the money. Okay. I'm going to find my next option just above that, that actually sets the spread. And I'm gonna buy, hey, oh, I'm out of, my, out of my area here. I'm gonna buy an out of the money call. That creates my spread. And I'm going to utilize the price action of the chart itself against itself in the setup for these trades. So I'm going to use the high probability, the high probability after an excessive move up or a big strong resistance level up here to take advantage of that resistance. Putting this trade on, and I want to put that trade on, it, it's, it's best if I can put that trade on why this stock is still acting bullishly because these premiums will be higher. Okay. <clears throat> I always look at the resistance levels. If I'm putting on a bear call credit spread, Think about the terminology of that strategy, bear call credit spread. I need this stock to respect price resistance. I need this stock to show me that that price resistance is going to hold and we start moving back. Okay. We start moving back. Um, Richard, I, I think you've been around quite a while. You know, the, the sizing of a credit spread trade is the same as the sizing of any trade that I make. I try to keep those credit spreads no more than 3% of my account at risk in the size of my trades. You know, Tom Sosnoff, the guy who created Thinkorswim, has a saying. And, of course, it was a little bit self-serving saying because as the broker, he was telling people to trade often. That's how he makes money. But the other part of that that made a tremendous amount of sense is trade small and trade often. Trade small and trade often. And I'll talk about how I made a lot of money doing this. When I was working full time, I couldn't watch the market during the day. This was back before, you know, everyone was carrying around mobile devices and things like that. I was I was working. I had no access to the market all day long. I traded a lot of credit spreads and I'll tell you my strategy here in just a second what I did. Okay? <clears throat> but again, it's it's a test of patience. We want to trade small. We want to trade and spread our trades around the market. Don't overdo one trade. My big loss 
that five digit loss that I told you about was me trading credit spreads that had about a 90% probability of success, which means I was way out of the money. I was only collecting somewhere between about 10 and 14 cents in credit on the trade. And I was putting all of my eggs in one basket. I was taking big, big trades. Hey, I had a 90 plus percent probability of success. Why wouldn't you take a big trade? And besides that, it worked about six months straight in a row. It just, it just brought in money. 2,000, 2,500, month after month for about six months. And then there's that one month that everything went against me. And not only did it wipe out that six months of profits, it took a whole lot more capital away from me as well. Because I oversized my trade. I oversized my trade. comment on the weeklies and I'm going to make it really quick uh, a comment on the weeklies if you want to trade weekly options you have to take on a day trader mentality you have you have to be looking at short term charts okay if you want to be a day trader be a day trader weeklies are a day traders position <laughs> kg yeah 90 10 spreads they will wipe you out really fast won't they blew up your account yep um the folks that i was trading with i was actually part of a trading service relatively new in my trading and credit spreads and the service went out of business after that one event because he broke everybody in in the service i was lucky enough that i didn't throw all in most of them threw all in because it had worked and it wiped them out all at once okay uh chad when i i, I said weeklies if you're going to cha trade weeklies you have to think about that day trading weeklies i'm and i'm talking when people talk weeklies they're talking about those seven day contracts okay so i normally stay where the institutions are the institutions aren't trading a lot of weeklies the institutions are trading the monthlies Okay. Um, you can, John, um, you certainly can just make sure that there's enough open interest in there. You know, if, if you look at a weekly and it's got 35 days to expiration, it's technically a weekly, but you're, you're playing a 30 day option there. Okay. You want to give yourself enough time to make money. If you take those really short credit spreads, here's the other thing about if you take a weekly credit spread, you could take a monthly on this and you could be five, six, eight, ten dollars, ten dollars away from current price if you take the monthly. If you take the weekly, you might be a buck or a buck and a half away. You're going to have to trade those trades very close to current price to make that work. And it puts you at higher risk. I want to get far away from the money. I want to get out there where I have a cushion in the trade. Okay. I want to get away from that. Now, the same thing is true on those stocks that have those kind of extreme sell-offs. Or they're really reacting heavily to a known support, price support in the chart. I'm gonna be placing these credit spreads 
below that price action. So I'm going to sell an out of the money put. This is a put trade. Okay. I'm going to sell that out of the money put somewhere around 30 deltas. And then I'm going to buy. that put further out of the money creating my spread but I'm going to use those really strong support and resistance levels in the chart okay <clears throat> so um, Richard, you can take, um, it's perfectly fine if you want to, uh, I mean, I trade, you guys see me trade $5 credit spreads all the time. $5 credit spreads at $5 wide. That means the one I sell and the one I buy is $5 between them. That's my maximum risk is 500 minus the credit. That's the next subject that I was going to talk about. If you take... A $5 wide credit spread, your maximum risk is $5 minus your credit. Okay, so five bucks. If you don't take a one third spread here, which means you want to try and be somewhere around a dollar sixty that you want to take in. If you take that in, you reduce the risk of your trade. If you take a trade and, and say you only collect 90 cents on that $5 wide spread, and that trade goes against you, does that make sense to you? You've taken a trade where you're risking a tremendous amount for very little. And one bad trade is going to wipe out a bunch of winners. Okay, so you have to have a set of rules, a rule that you're going to trade. So for example, if I'm trading a dollar wide spread, it's going to be really, really rare on a dollar wide spread if I take a trade in credit that has less than 30 cents. Now obviously that's just a little bit less than 33%, right? But I'm not likely going to take that trade. Okay, if I'm trading a $5 wide spread, you guys have heard me say this before, if it's $5 wide, I have a rule. In that rule, I could take a really, really good setup if it has about $1.20 credit in it, minimum. But I'm going to be shooting for, I'm going to prefer that $160 plus. Because the real critical point about taking on credit spreads, guys, is you have, to, you have to consider your risk before you enter the trade. If you don't consider your risk before you enter the trade, you're making a big mistake with credit spreads. I get lots of folks that send me stuff that just say, well, I've tried credit spreads, they don't work. No, credit spreads work just fine. But you didn't think about a set of guidelines, a set of rules, and how to set up the trade. You didn't think about that. You didn't think about the risks in taking such a small credit in a volatile stock and what that could mean to you in expense, okay, in losses. So here's what I did, and I just used some very simple math, guys. We know if we take a, a um, credit spread with a delta of around 30, that's our short strike, we know that that option has about a 70% probability of success. Okay? So if you did 10 trades, how many, how many of these trades could you expect to win based on the math?
Right, you should win about seven trades. Now we know that you're gonna go through periods where that, that number, that ratio is not gonna be perfect, right? Where the, where the volatility of the market doesn't make that perfect, okay? But if you do enough occurrences with a 30% delta or a 30 delta option and a 70% probability of success, you should have a winning ratio over time of seven out of 10 trades or close to it. Okay, so credit spread trading can be a great place to be, but here's the problem with credit spread trading. We're all impatient people, aren't we? Particularly those that are swing traders or day traders, they cannot um, get past the idea that it takes 30 days for the real money to come into these trades. They can't do it. They get all worked up about it. They micromanage it, and then they end up losing money on these trades. Because in order for that to work, you have to give it the time. You have to let the time pass, the probabilities work out. And they will. Okay, so what I did when I was, I traded a lot of these credit spreads. I would go with the idea that if I kept taking small trades all over the market, you know, I would take some in, in, um, um, over here, maybe this was, um, oil related stocks or an oil sector. And I would take some over here in the tech sector. I would take some up here and, um, you know, maybe it was retail or I'd take some, you know, wherever these trades set up, I would tra take these trades all over the market. And this trade, this trade might be a, a call credit spread up here. This one might be a put credit spread down here, call credit spread over here. I was all over the market. And these were relatively small trades. Okay. Because I had a goal. I had a goal to make an X amount of money every month. How many of you, how many of you would feel pretty good if you could figure out a way to consistently make 500 bucks a month? A thousand bucks a month consistently. You can do that with credit spreads. And you don't put all of your eggs in one basket. Okay, you take these little small credit spreads and you're working to take relatively small profits out of them over and over and over. Okay, over and over and over. And we would just constantly keep putting on these spreads in various markets all over the place and keeping them relatively small. Okay, that's how you build a good quality credit spread strategy without taking too much risk anywhere in the market. We're going to be all over the place. Okay. So having said that, we start looking at charts. We start looking for charts that are hitting significant resistance points. How many of you guys remember that I suggested CMG could set itself up for a short or a credit spread right here? Here's that long-term resistance, and this had had an excessive move up. Putting that credit spread out of the money up here was a winning trade. That was a winning position because we took advantage of the price resistance in the chart 
noticing that good strong resistance point and we placed a trade outside of that parameter. Now here's the thing, somebody said the biggest mistake that they made in credit spreads is not taking the trade off when the trade went against you. Okay, that's why I want to have a well-defined level of resistance. If I put on this credit spread up here and the stock, if I'm wrong and the stock bounces up through here, I got to get out of this trade. Right? I want to get out before this trade costs me much money. If this thing gets out of control, I can take a maximum loss in the trade and that will wipe out several good trades. So I have to manage this and close this trade before it creates that damage in this process. So I have to find those good solid support resistance levels in a chart. and base my trades around those support and resistance levels. Because if I just go in there and just throw trades all over the place and don't think about support and resistance, I'm really making a terrible mistake. Okay, I'm making a terrible, terrible mistake. All right, so I want trades that are defensible. I want trades that make sense in a defense strategy where I'm looking at those charts. Now, the next thing you can do is take those credit spreads in trades that are strongly trending. Take a look at a stock like, um, well, let's go Shopify. Doggone it, I can't type this morning. Take a look at Shopify. We know that this stock broke this downtrend, rallied above, and held support. And started to show bullishness. Could we have created credit spreads around this trade. Well, here's what I would have looked at in this trade had I been looking for a credit spread here in this chart on a bullish side, I would wait for this support to be tested. So the stock breaks through, pulls back, shows that we're gonna hold trend and support. So now I'm gonna place my credit spread below that support. And I'm going to allow the price action of that chart to just gradually move me, move it away from that trade. You can see in here there's probably really, really close to a 30 day position right here before we make this next level of support, which means I could have traded yet another credit spread trade here to allow that to move away. I'm taking advantage of the price action of the chart. I'm letting the chart determine when support has been made, when trend and support and resistance are in play, and I take those trades out of the way, out of the money, get away from that price, and have a cushion in the trade. I know in both of these trades, pretty clearly, I can set it up from initial, initially. If the stock breaks down below this level, I gotta close this trade, right? My credit spread trade down here is now at risk of maximum loss. I have to close this trade. Same thing would be true here if I set a credit spread down here and the stock breaks that low, I gotta get out of that trade. 
I have to close that position because the odds of my trade have just changed dramatically. This making some sense, guys? I'm finding these trades around these price levels that allow me to, to create these consistent positions. They're small positions. They're not giant positions. And then I have to be patient to just allow the chart to do what it has to do. Can you micromanage credit spreads? You'd better not. You'd better not. You better have a plan from the entry and then just pay attention to the trade. You don't have to overdo this trade because we're already out of the money. We already have a high probability of winning in the trade. As long as we set them up around good quality support and resistance levels, we have high probability wins in these trades. So take a, take a look at this. We rally up and we hit this resistance point. Now, the first resistance in a trend, does that make sense to put on a bear call credit spread up here? No, just like the bull put spread didn't make sense until this actually proves support. It has to prove support. If it proves support, now I can put on the bull put credit spread. Over here, when we get this fail right here, that's when we can put on a bear call credit spread. Resistance is proving itself in the chart. Price action is showing us that resistance. We put on that bear call, bear call credit spread and that's a winner. We can put it on over here and it's a winner. We can put it on over here and it's a winner. Does that make sense, guys? So we're looking at charts in a different way. We're not looking at a chart for that directional trade. We're looking for that directional support and resistance. We're looking at that good quality setup for that trade. We're not trying to pick bottoms or tops necessarily. We're waiting for that proof of support or we're waiting for that proof of resistance. and we have a defining line in the trade. We know if this trade shows us failure here, we put on this credit spread up here and we are wrong and the stock just reverses and comes back. If it breaks above here, what's our chances of this being a winning trade? It just, it went from high probability to very low probability really quick, didn't it? So we have to close that trade before it creates a massive loss in the position. We have to manage that position out, get out of that trade, say, look, I was just wrong on that one. Now, I'll tell you guys, that, and you might think this is pretty crazy, but because I was trading those small positions, it was not uncommon for me to have, and during the transition from month to month, you know, I would have 10, 15 or so um, trades starting to expire coming to the end where I could make either I would close them for a nice profit before they expired if I thought there was risk in them or I would hold them through expiration if there were really was really no risk in them you know like this if you put this credit spread on here and this pulls all the way back what's the risk of this being hit you know slim and none right it's not likely that that's going to be hit in that move so you just let it expire so that means i at times would had would have 20 25 plus trades on at some particular times because i would have credit spread trades expiring and new credit spread trades going on before that month end so i could get my rules between 45 and 30 days of putting those trades on so you can have 20, 25 plus trades pretty easily 
and make this a full-time strategy. Just do nothing else but credit spread. Trade. But you've got to be really careful with the setups. Timing is important. Timing is important. You just can't place a credit spread at any time of the month and expect it to win. You need that timing as well, right? They need to be setting up at the right time. So that means you need to be looking through those charts pretty consistently. You're looking for those big levels, support, resistance. Something that can help that I have always found to be really helpful is usually every week I go through an exercise where I look at a whole bunch of weekly charts. So for example, I might take my option list, okay, and I might change all of my charts to a weekly, and I flip through those charts and I start looking for the big patterns. I'm not looking for entries or exits so much. I'm looking for the big resistance levels. The big patterns where I can maybe set up bear call credit spreads. I'm looking for stocks that have reversed and might be coming back, breaking downtrends, holding support levels where I can put in credit spreads here. This entire trend up, this is a weekly, probably had multiple credit spreads in here that were tradable. And you can see all through here, there were possible credit spread trades that could have been taken. But I look at those weeklies for that really big pattern. And then drill down to the daily to see if I can set up that trade around those good, strong levels. Okay. And I still do this today. Usually on Sundays, Sunday afternoons, after I've kind of finished my, um, my weekly things that I have to do, get the lawn mowed, take care of everything, and that I sit down with a glass of tea, a big Coke, or something like that, and I just sit there and I look at a lot of charts. I draw up a lot of charts, and I start looking for those patterns. Okay, so as we go through charts, we have an opportunity to set up those really good credit spreads. Now, what about excessive moves? I made a, uh, gave an idea the other day about possibly taking a bull put credit spread, selling the 240, buying the 235 on the diamonds the other day. And the reason is, is because we've had this pretty strong move down. We know that if we move in one direction a certain period of time, the likelihood of that bounce back up was high. Now, day one, day one after I suggested this trade, and it was right here when we bounced off at 250, that 25,000 level in the market, day one, this trade was up 25% in one day. Now it's not a big profit, right? 25% of 30 cents is not a massive win. But I'm taking advantage of that excessive type move. Now this trade would be negative. But let me ask you, ask you guys here, if I have this credit spread all the way down here at this next level of support, what do you think the chances are that we get some kind of a bounce back in the market? Because I'm so far out of the money, I've taken advantage of this volatile move and placed a spread way deep in the chart. Even if this comes down into here, do you guys think we're gonna get a bounce back eventually here in the diamonds? So I'm putting the odds in my favor. What about over here? Anybody think that credit spread trading over here could have worked? We fail, we rally back and we fail. Credit spread trade. Fail, rally back and we fail. Credit spread trade. How about the big failure here? Proof of support here. Buyer stepping in, credit spread trade. 
Credit spread trade. Credit spread trade. Credit spread trade. Credit spread trade. Why didn't I pick this one for a bull put credit spread trade? Failure, failure. Broke support. So what has to happen for this trade to be a bullish trade? It has to prove new trend. That's right, not prove it. Has to prove new trend. So the next trade is over here. Credit spread trade. So we can place these trades all over the market, all different sectors, all different places, and look and, f and find those great trades. You know, we've talked about just how bearish IYT is, how, you know, the transports, how bearish it is. Do you guys see possible credit spread trades? Failure right here, credit spread trade above resistance, credit spread trade. How about here? Credit spread trade. Winning trades. How about the techs? Could we find something in techs? How about Microsoft? See any good credit spread trades in here? So when you think about credit spreads, I want you to think more about the setup than this idea of just trading a volatile stock. See, Microsoft is not a volatile stock. I, I, I will tell you honestly, I have to work really hard if I'm gonna get a one third credit spread on Microsoft. Timing has to be right. because the stock is not volatile. But because it's not very volatile, if I can get a 30 cent credit spread on a, on a dollar wide or 120, 130, 140 on a $5 wide, because it's not volatile, it's an easy trade to make. Okay. Uh, good question, Chad. Why would you trade credit spread trades around directionals? Number one, uncertainty. Okay. Or you're too busy to watch the market. Or you have a risk tolerance that doesn't allow you to trade those straight up directionals. We know that a straight up directional carries a considerable risk, right? Because, hey, if we just go straight directional, we can be wrong really easy. But if we set a credit spread way out of the money, the stock can just go sideways, bounce around in here, and we still win on the trade. So it's a bit more passive. It can also be, credit spreads can also be an enhancement to your directional trading. How many of you that just want to trade directional trades usually have a big portion of your account sitting in cash? So if you have, if you're trading directionally, couldn't you still trade small credit spreads around the market? Small credit spreads to give you those high probability trades, to give you that little time decay situation going on in those charts. They're a little bit more passive. They don't require quite as much attention to detail. And if you're busy like I was, I couldn't watch the market. I could set up that trade and make it absolutely mechanical. OK, 
Okay, so I could look at those charts a little bit differently. Oh, you're, you're exactly right, Richard. Getting one-third spreads is not easy. It's not easy, but it's doable. But who said trading was supposed to be easy? Who said trading wasn't work? That's our job, right? You got to look at the charts. It's not, I don't care if you go directional. I don't care if you use credit spreads. It's work. So you've got to take that time to do that evaluation. You've got to look at those charts and it takes quite a few charts sometimes. Now, one of the things I think will always save you money or save you time in this is creating a good quality watch list. Create that good quality watch list of stocks that have good option volume in them. Don't waste your time looking at stocks that have crummy volume or they're, you know, they're just, just don't waste your time with them. Because you're just going to look at a lot of charts and, and have nothing to do. So look at charts that have really good option volume in them, create that list, and then just work to manage that list. And here's another benefit of this. If you're watching these charts for credit spread trades, you get a pretty good sense pretty quickly when support is in, when we've confirmed resistance, right? Because we're watching these charts consistently. We get a sense of how they move, the length of time it takes them to make a move. You know, Richard, I don't think, and I tried for years, I tried for years to find um, some kind of scan that would give me that very, very clear price support and resistance. But the truth of the matter is, there's really no way to scan that. You can find stocks pulling back to support. You can find stocks moving back to resistance and sort them out a little bit of that. You could sort them by trends. Okay. But there's no good way to really identify that price pattern in a scan, right? A chart, a scan can't determine whether or not this is a long-term support, a short-term support. Can't A scan can't tell you very much about a trend. It can tell you it's trending, but it can't tell you where it is in its trend. And if you try to over-define it, here's what happened to me. When I tried to over-define it, I could find no charts in a scan because I'd overdefined a scan so much, I'd limited it so much, no charts came up. Because there's too many variables. So the best thing that you can do is just sit down, pour yourself a Coke. Pour yourself an iced tea, pour yourself something, and just sit down and go through a list of charts and mark them up. I used to tell people what I, what I did and how I built an account doing this. Required about an hour a day in time, and then two or three hours on the weekend, where I would just look at a lot of charts. <laughs> yeah, you might want to you might want to avoid alcohol when you're looking at charts. How do you know if you've got a one third spread? What's one third of a dollar wide spread? If 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 I go to IWM, and I haven't looked at the chart, I'm not, I'm not suggesting there's an IWM trade here, okay guys? 
not suggesting. We got 48 days to exp expiration on the Julys. Okay. So if I were looking at a bull put credit spread, meaning that I'm expecting the market to somewhat in, in a certain period of time to bounce back up, if I can find a good level of support, a place in there where the stock could react to, come down here. These are dollar wide spreads. How do you know if you have a one third spread? Sell that option right there that's. Uh, excuse me. No, no, not that option. I'm, I was thinking directional there all of a sudden. Come over here. Uh, bull put credit spread is what we want. Bull put credit spread coming up off of that bottom. Okay, so we're going to look at something out here that has somewhere around 30 deltas. We're going to sell this option. Okay, and we're going to buy this option. That's a dollar wide credit spread. Do you have a 30% credit in here? Do you have 30 cents? Nope. That's how you know. It's that easy. One third credit. Okay. But what if we had some volatility? What if what if Monday morning IWM were to gap down? Anybody think IWM has the potential of gapping down on Monday? Yeah. What if IWM has a volatility move and then we bounce right back up? Couldn't we set a credit spread out of the money down here to just allow that stock to do what it naturally does? It's going to rally back up, test some downtrend, bounce around in here and set that credit spread. And couldn't that at that point have that 30 cent credit in it? And here's the other thing that I will do from time to time if I'm looking at a credit spread. If I get a credit spread that's close like that, 27 cents, I'll just enter the order like this. And I'll put a limit of 30 cents on it and just set the trade. Because if I get that little volatility move, it'll fill me at 30 cents and then start bouncing back up or bouncing down depending on what the trade is. I try to get that that trade set up this way. That's right. Put your put your trade out there. See if it, they'll take it. You never know. Take advantage of those big changes. You know, for example, I don't think there's, um, there probably wouldn't be any really good trades in like, um, there might not be 30 cent or good credit spreads here. But take a look at this move. Do you guys think that's parabolic? Anybody see resistance up here? Well, there's actually price resistance right here, right? In the chart. That's a pretty parabolic move. If I could set a credit spread up here, wouldn't that make sense? Get above that price action right there. Take advantage of those extreme moves in a market. Uh, Mary, what about earnings? Good, good question. If I look out and I see that earnings is going to be within the next couple of weeks, I'm, I'm usually just going to avoid that for any kind of a credit spread. I might, you guys know that I'll do this from time to time. I'll take a stock like Microsoft and if I can get a directional entry ahead of earnings, if I get a good setup, oftentimes some of these big stocks 
will rally in anticipation of earnings, but I'm going to be out before earnings. But for the credit spread, if I look out there a couple of weeks and there's earnings coming, and TC2000 makes that real easy. If there's earnings coming within a couple of weeks, I'm probably going to avoid it because I have to have enough time on this trade to really make it worthwhile. And if I don't have, you know, uh, that good three plus week period for time decay to occur, probably not going to take that trade. Because these trades are about the setup and they're about the time passing. So I will usually avoid credit spread trades around or close to earnings events. Remember, I, I'm, really, I'm really picky about my trades. I want my trades to be very um, simple. And there's nothing about earnings that makes a trade simple. So I generally avoid that. Even when I take a directional trade, you guys see, I, I mean, if I take a directional trade, I'm usually going to try and take advantage of the, the, the um, anticipation of good results. I'll take it before the earnings event, and I'm out at earnings. I'm not trading earnings. Earnings to me is, I, I hate them. I hate earnings. It's massive stock manipulation, and you never know what's going to occur. A stock can have really great earnings report and fall like a rock. They can have a terrible earnings report and rally. Take a look at Uber. What did Uber say? They only lost a billion dollars or something like that for their earnings report. Okay? But it was in line with the loss that they expected, so the stock rallied stupid they lost a billion bucks so it's a manipulation and so i just generally try to avoid those so the rule on that if we're within a couple of weeks of earnings i'm not going to trade them because there's not enough time for my decay that i want in those in those trades Last but not least, I'm going to talk about exiting these trades early. One of the things that really hangs up a lot of traders is, is they get into this idea, well, if I wait for this option to expire, I don't have to pay any commissions. Okay, but let's say, for example, we have a resistance level here and we place that credit spread trade on. We did it at the right time. The stock failed, pulled away. But about 25 days into this trade, this stock finds support down here and starts working its way back up. And people will hold on to this trade with this idea, I need to make 100%. I need, to, I need the full win on this trade to make this worthwhile. And that's not true. Okay, if you get your expected move in the trade and the stock is responding to a support level in the chart, don't hold out on this. 25 days into this, you might look at your, your spread trade and people will go, well, yeah, but you know, just a couple more days and I can make the full trade. And if they actually looked and calculated what they're actually trying, trying to achieve, there may only be two cents left in the trade. And we're going to risk the, our entire profit. We're going to risk a 75, 80% gain on the credit spread for two cents. Right, so if you get your expected move in that trade and you get 20, 25 days under your belt on that credit spread trade, and then the stock starts to react back hard, close the trade, take the profit. I don't know anyone that loses money by taking profits on a consistent basis.
In fact, there's a lot of folks out there that will tell you if you get a credit spread into 30, 35% profit, they just take them off. If you get 30 to 35% consistently on a winning trade, how can that be a bad situation? Now, in a credit spread trade, here's the, th here's the problem. And here's what people think. Well, I took a 30 cent credit spread. Okay. 30 to 35% of that's not a big win, is it? And so they don't take the trade off. They don't consider how great a percentage of win that is on the overall trade. They don't take the trade off because it's not enough money. And they end up losing on the trade because they don't respond to it. Now, because I am so stringent on how I put on trades, I usually don't hold with this idea of taking them off at 30 to 35% automatically. And the reason is, is because I've done the technical analysis. I've done the work. I've found the good resistance points, the good support points. So I can normally expect a higher percentage return on those trades if I've got it right. Oh yeah, the analyze, the analyze will certainly, uh, tab will help you a lot, yeah. If you go in and analyze that trade and understand that position a little bit better, it'll help you a lot. Here's the other thing that I think everyone should consider. We've all had this trade, right? Where we, let's say we find a great support level. Stock responds to that level. We have our credit spread trade down here and then that stock just shoots up. And within no time at all, you've got a 60, 70% profit in this trade well what do we know about a stock that just gets that really explosive move in one direction chances are it's going to pull back right chances are there's going to be profits taken so if you're in that trade early and it just makes that explosive move close the trade take the profit Take advantage of that explosive move and the change in implied volatility and just close the trade. You did your job. You advanced your account forward. <laughs> That's right, Bob. <laughs> Knock somebody down to take that profit. Okay, does that make sense, guys? So we're gonna utilize the price action of the chart. We're gonna think about our charting a little bit differently. And here's the cool thing about this. If you work on this, guys, it will make you a better trader because it, it, it necessarily has to make you a better trader because if you're going to credit spread trade, you have to be patient. You have to wait for the good patterns to develop. You have to be patient for the trade. It has to be very rule-based to make this extremely successful. And it can be extremely successful. I've had periods in my trading history where I would put on these trades and out of 20, 25 trades have one or two that lost. We're talking about win-loss ratios that can be really, really high. But it's slow, right? It's boring. A good spread credit spread trader is bored to death because there's nothing to do. Once your credit spread trades on, now it's just watch and wait for time to pass. Um, yeah, you know, Mary, I use a lot of alerts because I'm here and in front of computers all the time, I use a lot of alerts. 
and I also put stops in. So for example, particularly early on in a trade, if I would enter this trade, you know my rules would be if the stock, my credit spread trades down here, if the stock moves against me early on in the trade, if we come down here and break this, my stop loss just needs to be here. I need to close this trade. Because the worst damage you can suffer in a credit spread trade is early in the position. It's had no time to let that theta do its job. So if it's early in the trade and you get attacked, just close it. Okay. One thing that's cool about thinkorswim, if you get close to expiration, if you have an option that's less than a nickel in value within a week of expiration, they don't charge you a commission to close it. They're actually encouraging you to close the trade. Okay. Um, no, Jen. Um, I get that question a lot too. When you say the leg that's working, um, I'm going to go to this to explain that. So we find a stock that's testing support in here. We have a nice credit spread set up in here. And what Jen is referring to is we've sold this contract and we've bought this contract here. Second, I'm changing colors. And we bought this contract here. And, this, and all of a sudden the stock starts moving against us. You know, we get into that trade, it moves against us. What Jen is asking is, should we close just this side of the trade, the trade that the part that's really going to cause us pr trouble, and then try to hold this one because this is or long this this position? And the answer to that is no. And the reason is because it's not placed correctly. If you close this trade, what do you have? If you close this credit spread, You've morphed this credit spread into a directional trade. Have we followed the rules for a directional trade then? No, we've got an option that's way out of the money. A very low probability of winning. Okay, so if you're wrong on a credit spread, the best thing to do is just close it. Because if you're wrong on this credit spread and this stock starts to move down hard and fast, wouldn't it be better to just close out this trade and then think about placing, if you want to stay with your credit spread, placing your credit spread up here? Wouldn't that make sense? It's failing. So if you're wrong on a credit spread trade, it's just better to close the trade than it is to try to manipulate it and try to pull, you know, a few pennies out of it. Because oftentimes what you end up doing is making a bad situation worse. How many of you have ever had this happen where you get a whip like this in a stock? So let's just use this credit spread example. We get this whip down in the stock, we close this leg and we're trying to maximize this one. Okay, we're thinking, oh, now the stock's gonna prove itself down and then that stock, because of the whip in that move, whips right back. And now this is a big loser. It's an out-of-the-money put option that's a big loser.
And that's correct, uh, particularly on call options, Kimberly. You don't want to manipulate them that way because you're going to end up being, you could be, you could end up being naked. Now, if you're holding the long trade, that doesn't matter. Remember, if you're closing the short trade, the one that's being attacked, you're not naked in that trade. You're just, you've taken on a directional position, but you've taken on a bad directional position. You're only considered naked if you have a short strike still open all by itself. Oh no, um, one, thing, uh, one thing I rarely do is, you know, a lot of people will say, well, how about you just go to the SPX? Just trade the SPX, they're all $10 wide strikes. Um, if anybody's ever traded SPX, NDX, any of those kind of things, that's where the big boys play. There's lots of volatility in there, and that's a really good way to get your head handed to you. Credit spread trades, I rarely, I rarely leg into, Mary. Rarely. Um, and the reason is because the, really the setup for me for the credit spread trade is putting on that short position. Okay, but I will, I will, um, I will leg into them from a directional trade. Say, for example, um, I'm directionally long on this trade here. And I see that we run into resistance and then I get this failure up here. Okay, I may, as we attack this resistance up here, as we attack the resistance, I may to hedge my long trade, and it starts out as a hedge for my long trade. As a hedge for my long trade, sell an out of the money option up here to hedge the long position. And then when the stock shows me failure, I close my long trade after I make this a credit spread trade. Put the credit spread trade on, then I can make money as the stock rolls back but it starts out as a hedge to a directional position. I don't straight up leg into a credit spread trade unless I'm already in a directional position on that, on that trade. Does that make sense, Mary? So it starts out as a directional hedge and then it might morph to a credit spread trade. One that we did that was just, uh, you couldn't have picked a better trade. Um, this was some time back, um, right in here. We did this with Valero. We got into this trade on Valero and we were up massively in this trade. It just kept going up. And we were up like 140% on the trade. And as we approached that 100 resistance, I told everybody to sell that 100 strike, sell it to hedge this long trade. And then when the stock showed failure right here, I just told everybody to close the long trade and turn this into a credit spread up here. And then, so we, so we made this great profit on the long directional trade, but then made another great profit on the pullback. So it starts out as a hedge. Carlos, um, uh, margin on credit spreads is defined by your risk. It's very, very simple. Okay, uh, very simple. If you have a, um, a dollar wide spread and you've collected 30 cents on that spread, what's your risk in that trade? Well, it's a dollar minus 30 cents. Your margin is gonna be $70 on a single wide spread. That's your max risk. 
Now there are brokers. Now this is Thinkorswim. Thinkorswim understands what your max risk is. There are brokers that are going to, um, at least I understand, I've been told, there are brokers that are going to hold the margin here at a dollar because they don't understand the trade. If you're using a broker that doesn't understand option trading, that's going to happen. Okay, but your maximum risk is always defined in a credit spread trade, always defined. So your maximum risk or your maximum margin should be the risk, the total risk in the trade. Oh, you certainly can, John, but you guys, you guys know that I'm an AMD. Okay, I'm in AMD and I'm managing this on a weekly. I'm up 60% in the trade and I've sold calls against this multiple times. So I'm hedging these moves when we go sideways and things like that. I have no full on failure here, but if this turned into a full on failure, then I would just take my credit spread or my uh, my short strike if, if there's enough spread left in it. OK, convert that short strike into a credit spread trade and then close the long position because I can still make money. I'm in a in a trade that I can make money to the downside now. Okay. VLO's coming into support. What did we <laughs> what did we talk about in here? Coming into support. Okay. So can we speculate that this is going to be support? Or do we have proof that this is support yet? Didn't mean to do that. Do we have proof of support yet? Do we have any kind of proof yet that there is going to be support here? So it would be an, a speculation trade. And if I were going to do a, a speculation trade on this based on this move because of the volatility, I would set that trade down here because I cannot take a directional trade on this, right? There's no proof that we're gonna bounce here. So if I did put that credit spread on here, my cutoff line would be right here. If we drop below that, I'm out of this trade. So you have to have a rule around that. Okay, because it's full on speculation. There's no proof. We, we haven't even broken the downtrend here yet, right? So this would be full on speculation that this is, that we're gonna go up from here. And see, it's okay if you wanna do that, but I'm gonna prefer to do this. There's the downtrend, wait for it to break resistance, hold it as support, show buyers, and then I put on my credit spread here. This is the easier trade without all the speculation. Make sense? But it's okay if you want to do that. Just make sure you have a hard, fast rule that you're going to control that trade. If you're wrong, be wrong and get out. Yep. Patience and discipline. Patience and discipline. Take patience and discipline. And B, I answered that. Because I wanted to stay in the trade. I don't know how long a stock is going to go up. And I usually expect after a good solid move up, the stock could be pull, pull back. So if I want to hold it for a longer term position... I'm going to hedge the trade. You guys know that I don't do just really quick swing trades.
so I hedge my position for that pullback. All right. You guys know that I will commonly hedge all trades. I'm going to protect myself. I'm going to bring more money to the trade. If we're talking directional, and by the way, MB, this is completely off the subject, okay? That's okay, but it's completely off subject. If I were in shop, let's say I got long into this trade. And I think shop still has more upside potential, don't you? Trend is strong. All this is doing is consolidating. So if I get into this trade and I'm up in profit, if I have that hedge trade up here, I'm getting paid while this is decaying, paid while this is going sideways. Bob C. often calls selling call options against your existing trade free money. It reduces the risk on your trade. Well, gen generally, Mary, you want to try to avoid splits. At least I do, because everything changes. Your options get really funky. They usually have to rewrite options. They get really weird. Um, it's hard to, and it, it's really hard to make a good quality trade around the split, if you ask me. So I try to avoid those. Yeah, there's not too many splits. And, and, you know, you also should be thinking about, you know, dividend payments. If you're in a bull put credit spread and a dividend comes out, you can expect the stock to pull back. It usually won't damage support, but you can expect the stock to pull back. So it's always good to be aware of those things. How important is credit spread trading tool compared to other stock trading setups in your arsenal? You know, there's credit spread trading groups out there that will tell you credit spreads is the only way to make money. And I'm going to tell you that's wrong. It's, it's just another way to bring money in to your account. It's, it's one strategy. It's no different. It's no more special than a directional trade. There's also groups of people out there who will tell you that if you trade directional options, you're just nuts. We'll tell that to Rick. Rick started a year and a half ago with a $5,100 account trading options, his first year trading options. In a year and a half, he's built an account of over $30,000 doing nothing but buying calls and buying puts. Okay, so do you have to be a credit spread trader to be successful? No. It's just another strategy. It's another tool. I don't think any strategy is more important than another one. It all depends on the chart trading setup. Say, for example, you're looking at CMG, okay? You see a great position setting up on CMG for a bear call credit spread because of this massive resistance up here. All right, you may choose the bear call credit spread because how many people take a direct put on a $700 stock? Not very many people, right? Because it's a big expensive trade.
this is the kind of trade that Rick says, I don't even look at him because I can't trade him. All he does is directional calls and directional puts. But if you add in the ability to do credit spreads, you can make money on this chart the same with not, without risking massive money. So it's just another tool. There's nothing special about any strategy. It all depends on how you set up the trade. Okay? So remember, in your credit spreads, and I'm going to go back to this just really quickly. In your credit spreads, make sure, guys, that what you're focusing on is the right thing. You're focusing in the credit spread, not just on the strategy saying this is the greatest strategy in the world. You're focusing on that good quality setup, the discipline and the focus to wait for the good quality setup. That makes a good credit spread trader. Not just saying credit spreads are the greatest thing out there. Credit spreads in a volatile market is where you want to be. That is baloney. If you don't set them up correctly, you're asking for a beating. Okay? So, Mary, thanks. And thanks to the, the Dallas-Fort Worth group for being here today. We really do appreciate it. Thank you very much. Appreciate it a ton. And if you guys have questions, if there's anything I can help you with, please let me know. By the way, this video will be over um, later on this weekend, maybe uh, Monday. This video will be over on my YouTube channel. Okay, if you want to watch it again, it will be available there. If you're not a subscriber to my YouTube channel, could you guys do me a favor? Go over there to my YouTube channel, become a subscriber. Videos like this are always being posted over there, and it's all free. So please take advantage of that. All right, it'll be there later, later this weekend or by Monday. Everyone take care. Have an awesome, awesome weekend. I appreciate you a ton for being here. We'll see you all bright and early Monday morning for the morning market uh, preparation video every Monday morning. All right, guys, take care of yourselves. Have a great one. We'll talk to you all soon.